thanks everybody for coming. Um, my name is Greg Donovan, and uh, I'm the technical lead for search at Etsy.com. And I'm going to be talking about uh, how we use solar and Lucene at Etsy, and how we maximize what solar gives you out of the box, uh, how we do custom low-level work, and how we know when to do each. And so I've been going through some, some concrete examples of each. So a little background about myself. I've been working uh, at Etsy for about a year and a half on, on solar and Lucene applications. And before that, I was at the, the ladders.com, the, uh, the job search website, uh, also working on solar and Lucene. Um, so let's talk about Etsy. Uh, Etsy is an online marketplace for handmade goods, uh, vintage items, and crafting supplies. Uh, there are millions of unique items from sellers in 150 different countries, and we, we connect buyers with, uh, with sellers, and what we hope is a, you know, a meaningful connection between buyer and seller, uh, and we provide a, a platform for, for artists to, to make a living selling what they, what they make. Um, there's over 8 million members, and right now about 9.3 million distinct items sold by more than 800,000 active sellers. And we've got a total of about a billion page views a month. So the, the scale is only increasing. Um, and so what are these 9.3 million items? So they're, they're hand, most of them are handmade. So you have these uh, very, very unique items like these. These are statistical distribution pillows um, <laughs> generated with, uh, with R code. And uh, if you can name all six distributions, I would like to talk to you after. Um, that would be very impressive. Um, we have this one hanging in our office. This is a, uh, a painting. It's a painting of a monkey riding a unicorn, is what it is. And it's, uh, so you don't find these in many, on many e-commerce sites. So, so how do you figure out uh, which monkey unicorn picture to show people? It's a, it's a relevance challenge. Uh, this is another one of my favorites. Uh, it's Conan O'Brien. Um, this, uh, this is another handmade item, another one of my favorites. Uh, so what are some of the problems we face with this, uh, this very unique, uh, very unique e-commerce environment? So scale is one of them. We've got almost 10 million items, and that number is only going up as we, as we move into different countries, as more and more uh, active sellers start using the site. And we've got about 35 million queries a day, and that's only going to go up uh, over time, and it's been going up, and around the holidays it explodes, uh, as, as do pretty much most e-commerce sites. So most items, as you've seen, are one of a kind. Um, so this is a very different problem than somebody like Amazon faces. So Amazon can do things like use shopping cart co-occurrence. So I go to my, my cart and I buy A and B. Somebody else comes in and they buy A and they recommend them B. Uh, recommendation problem solved. So Etsy is very different. By the time somebody buys A, A is gone. You can't, you can't recommend it again because it doesn't exist in the marketplace. So it creates some, uh, some real challenges. It's also a competitive marketplace. You've got 800,000 sellers who are all competing for, for views and for clicks and for, for purchases. Um, they all describe their own items, so there's problems of mistagging, self-promotion, uh, inaccurate metadata. Uh, there's discovery issues. You've got 10 million different items. How do, you, how do you make those items discoverable for people? How do you help make that, that many items navigable? It's also much less of a known item search. So you might go to eBay and you type in iPod Nano. And it's pretty easy to figure out what the intent of the query is and how to serve that query. But if you go to Etsy and you type unicorn, do people want paintings? Do they want pillows? What, do, what, do, what does the buyer mean? There's also a lot of gifting behavior and a lot of exploratory behavior. Uh, and it's an international marketplace, so you have people searching in many, many different languages. So those are some of the problems we're facing. Um, we're, we're located in Brooklyn. We've got about uh, 80 engineers. Uh, we've got folks from, from Google, Flickr, Twitter, Yahoo, Microsoft, and Amazon uh, working on these problems. We've got a very pragmatic engineering culture. Uh, it's a t-shirt that our VP of engineering actually screen, screen prints to emphasize the point. Uh, just ship, just get software out the door. It's uh, adopted from uh, the Steve Jobs phrase that uh, great artists ship. Uh, so let's talk about, so what I want to talk about uh, is what we've learned. So how we've maximized solar out of the box, uh, how we've maximized what solar gives you, and I'm saying out of the box being everything short of running custom code inside the same VM that solar is running in. So everything that the, the REST API, the service API gives you, how to maximize that. How to hack at a lower level. Uh, how, to, how to use some of the lower level library interfaces. And how to know when to do each one. And I think that's an important point. Uh, and so what's our overall approach to tackling these search problems? So we have these, and all of us working in search, we've got very difficult problems around ranking and discovery. 
and if we spend too much of our time on infrastructure, we're not going to get to those problems. So we want to let solar handle as much of the infrastructure as we can. Um, so we, want to, we don't want to get derailed building things that don't need to be built, and we want to leverage as much as solar has given us. Uh, so the first question is, what are we going to use? Are we going to use solar, uh, or are we going to use Lucene by itself? So it's a question that uh, I think a lot of people confront. And I've, I've had a lot of discussions with people at meetups, at conferences, and with interviewees, where they describe a very difficult problem they might have, where they say that they can't use solar for it. It's too, it's too unique of a problem. They have to just use Lucene. And I'm often very skeptical of that. Because if you just use Lucene, you've got all of these new problems, all these new infrastructure problems you have to solve for, by yourself. Caching problems, analysis chain problems, indexing problems, handling the index readers. And if you, if you skip out on, on solar, you skip out on all of those features. Um, so I often find myself somewhat perplexed by the decision, in a lot of cases, to, to just use solar. I mean, to just use Lucene. Uh, so I've prepared a very sophisticated flowchart, if you're facing this decision yourself, that you can use to help you make this decision. So, uh, so it looks like this. Um, so if you're Twitter, and you, you're serving billions of real-time queries, uh, every day, and you've, you've, you've got your own branch of Lucene, by all means, just use Lucene. Uh, but if you're, if you're regular mortals like ourselves, uh, let's use solar and take advantage of all the benefits. Um, this chart can also be used, by the way, to determine whether you should do real-time search, um, which is also, uh, the, people are more interested in real-time search than is often justified, uh, and it creates a whole lot of new problems. Um, so which version of solar are we gonna use? Uh, that's, that's kind of the next problem. Do we use Solar 3.1? Do we use one of the branches? Do we use Trunk? And we use Trunk. So we've, uh, we've kind of learned not to fear Trunk. The, the, the Lucene developers are amazing. The Solar developers are amazing. The testing infrastructure they have is, is absolutely world class. So it's very rare that bad code actually makes it to Trunk. And if you look at Lucid's uh, enterprise offering, I believe they actually pull a version of Trunk, um, add some patches, and, 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 and ship that. Um, so if you're if you're trying to evaluate, I would, I would look at Trunk. We did this in the fall. We looked at uh, what was on Trunk, what was in the last uh, shipping release, and we wanted the GeoSearch features. We wanted some function query enhancements. So we, we looked at a version of Trunk, and we didn't find any problems. We, uh, one thing you can do is you can actually follow the changes. So you can go there. You can look at Solar's, uh, Solar's Hudson, follow the changes as they come in, look at the commits, and you can get a sense for, for how stable of a place Trunk is in and also get on the mailing lists and see what people are saying about the state of Trunk. Uh, and you can often get a lot of great features that way. So don't, don't fear Trunk. Usually, it's, uh, it will leave you in good shape. So let's talk about a, a real application we're gonna build now. So people come to our site and we wanna know where they are. So we wanna, we wanna give, uh, give them all sorts of local search features um, and you know, optimize local features. So we wanna know where, what location they are. So, it's a, it's a data normalization problem. People come, they start typing a location, and if you don't provide any auto-suggest for them, they're gonna type gibberish. Uh, they're gonna misspell things, they're gonna give you bad data. So we wanna provide an auto-suggest feature that auto-suggests valid locations uh, that map to known latitude and longitude coordinates, uh, and we'll end up with much better data and much better, much better geo-search features. So we wanted to build this, and we, we, we thought this was a good example of maximizing everything that Solar gives you out of the box. Um, so these are, as you type suggestions, per keystroke, we're giving you what we think are the 10 most relevant locations for what you started to type. Uh, and it's context sensitive. So based on where you are, based on your IP address, we figure out where you are, and we figure out, based on the population of the cities near you, um, how far away they are and how big they are. So we were inspired by uh, a feature that Facebook has, and they have the same feature. You know, you go to your profile and you say where you live. Um, and I did the same thing here, and the first suggestion I got was Seoul, South Korea. So we, we thought we could do better and make these, make, make these suggestions context sensitive. So we ended up using a combination of GeoIP, so very cheap, uh, you know, $300 GeoIP database, and then a free data set of, uh, uh, called the MaxMind Geo, uh, World Cities Database. Just a big flat file of cities, lat longs, and populations. And, and we took that and indexed it in a very basic way and then just applied a single solar query to it and ended up with very good results. Uh, so what you have here 
is you have your main solar query, and it's a wildcard query uh, using the, the Lucene query parser. You've got the, the latitude longitude, and this is after we've taken your IP address and mapped your latitude longitude. Um, and then we're sorting by a function query using, uh, using the population of the city and your distance to that city. Um, and so we found that the, the square root of the population divided by the distance uh, tended to yield pretty good results uh, without too much tuning and tweaking. We were able to build this in a few days without really very much code at all. I mean, this is, you know, 50, 75 lines of code to build the whole thing. Um, and I think a great example of, uh, of using custom query parsers, so using, in this case, using the, the, the Lucene query parser uh, and the function query parser, um, and taking advantage of wildcard queries. So wildcard queries weren't always really f uh, practical and fast to use in Lucene, especially if you had a big term dictionary. Uh, but since some of the, the speed ups using uh, automata query, they're actually very practical to use in even as you type suggestions. So I know there are, um, there are uh, auto-suggest components and very specialized uh, ternary search trees for, for doing auto-suggest. But if you just do a regular wildcard query, um, it will actually perform uh, just about as well as you, you need. Uh, unless you have a massive data set, and this is even applying, uh, you know, a geodistance per keystroke. Um, so it's very fast. So it's a good, uh, a good lesson for me is to really know the query parsers. The query parsers are a high-level interface, um, and they're, they're very different. So don't just rely on dismax. There's life beyond dismax. Uh, and there's nothing magic about what's in, in solar config in the examples. You can, you can really generate very, very powerful queries uh, using these, there's, there's some more, writing your own, we'll get to those later. Um, the Lucene query parser, the field query parser, term query parser, the boost query parser, which we'll talk more about later, the function query parser, as you saw with the GeoSearch query, and then uh, good old Dismax. Um, so let's talk about another way to do ranking. Uh, so Etsy has, this, Etsy has this application called the Treasury, and the Treasury you go and you basically find, uh, you take 16 items that you like. And it's a basically a way of doing lists of favorites, and then you tag them, and you do them along a theme, uh, and then people can browse them and search them and, and share them with each other. So it's a way of doing curation. So you've got 10 million items, and as a curator, you want to highlight uh, some of your favorites around a theme. And then we make these searchable. We make the collection searchable, so you can search the, uh, the, the data in the, the, the curated list, and then you can search uh, its metadata and then the metadata of any of the listings in that, uh, in that collection. Um, and so all these things are sorted by hotness. Um, and hotness is, uh, you know, a secret formula, uh, like Flickr's interestingness. Uh, but you can kind of guess what, what makes one treasury hotter than another, certain user behavior. It's, uh, it's pretty easy to guess. So, but this hotness up, is updated every, is updated constantly. Every, every few minutes, hotness changes for all the treasuries and we, we show you new stuff. Um, so that presents a, an indexing problem and a ranking problem. If, uh, if, every, if every document in the index has a value that changes every few minutes, does that mean we need to re-index our whole collection every few minutes? And so this is actually kind of a complicated index to build. You have to join a lot of different data sets. You've got the treasuries themselves, you've got all the listings contained in them, and then you've got all the shops contained within those listings. So it's gonna take a while to, to rebuild this index if we have to do that. Um, so how are we gonna do it? How are we gonna update these hotness scores every minute? And the solution is external file field. So external file field has been mentioned in at least one other talk. Um, and I think it's worth mentioning again because I think it's kind of underutilized uh, as, a, as a very sophisticated ranking feature that you can, you can use very easily. So all you do is you place a file of sorted key value pairs in the data directory. Uh, and then that, that will create a, a, a kind of virtual field that you can use at, uh, at query time for ranking and sorting. Um, so it's very useful as it is, what's provided for you. It's also a very useful example to read and see how it works. Uh, so let's look at some of the configuration. So in your schema XML, you specify this external file field. Um, give it a name. It's pretty easy to set up, and you say what the key field is. So in our case, it's going to be the, the treasury ID. Um, default value, so if it's not specified in the file, what should things default to? Um, and, and the val type float, and it's always a float. Um, and then there's the, the file of hotness, and it's, uh, it's basically external underscore 
the name of the field, and then the uh, epic milliseconds uh, is, the, is the format. And so you generate these files yourselves, uh, and then you just place them in that directory, um, and that's the format, just the, the primary key ID. Um, it doesn't have to be the primary key. It can be any, any field in your, in your index that's uh, an integral field. Um, actually, it doesn't have to be an integer. It could be a... Um, and then the, the float value representing the score. And then at query time, all we do is function query uh, and sort by that hotness. And that's, that's about it. Um, and so that lets us update every couple of minutes. Um, so a couple of caveats about how this works. So uh, you can't just update the field. Um, you, can't, um, you can't just update the file and get new results. You have to do a commit. So this file gets read in every time you do a commit. So on index reader creation, this thing gets read into memory. So, and eventually a giant float array uh, handles the, uh, the, the sorting. So, since this, uh, since this happens every time an, an index reader is created, you're gonna wanna warm it up. So I would add a, a warm up query to your solar config to make sure that you don't have a, you know, a, a three second query the first time you do one of these sorts. Um, and it needs all of your documents in this one giant file, um, which means that you've got some operational concerns about how to produce a file with, uh, with a score for every one of your documents uh, every time you want to update it. So it puts the, puts the burden on you as the application developer to, to generate that big list. Um, and I think eventually external file field might be somewhat deprecated in favor of some of the, uh, the column stride fields and doc values that you may have heard uh, uh, spoken about yesterday. Um, but it's, uh, it's very powerful right now. Uh, let's look at some other ways to do ranking. So the boost query. So the boost query is also very powerful. Um, so let's say somebody comes to our site and they search for desk. They search for, they want to find desks on the site. And let's say we've done some analytics and we've determined that people who look for desks, they want to see furniture and they don't want to see stuff that's made of acrylic. That stuff is generally not, not part of what they desire. So we've done this analytics and, and we, want to, we want to favor the furniture in the result set and, and down boost the, the, the acrylic stuff. Uh, so we very simply can do, do boost query. So the boost query parser, um, uh, exclamation point boost, B equals rel, V equals QQ. Um, so the different, the different components there. Boost, we're specifying the, the, the name of the query parser. Um, we're using the local param syntax. So between the curly brackets is the local params. So there's two, uh, two parameters to the boost query. B is the boost query itself. So the boost query is not going to be used to determine what the, uh, the match set. That's just going to be determined, that's going to just move the scores up and down. Uh, the V is going to basically be the, the main query. That's going to determine what's in and what's out. Uh, and that's going to have its own score, and then you're going to use the boost query to, to move that up and down. Um, and this is using parameter dereferencing. And parameter dereferencing is a very powerful facility of the, the HTTP API. Uh, and it lets you, so if you look at the QQ, so we've basically specified a pointer to the HTTP parameter named QQ. So the boost query parser knows to you to go to that parameter, pull that in, and that's gonna, that can have the, the full query parser syntax within there. We could have specified a, a dismax query or you know, a, very, a very sophisticated query inside of QQ. Um, and then the same goes to, uh, for rel. Um, and that's, uh, that's what used, is used to boost. And you can see we're actually using a negation query here. Uh, and that's something that the Lucene query syntax supports. So we're, we're specifying that anything that has the material acrylic gets a, gets a negative, negative boost. Um, so how do we get this kind of analytics? So if we've, how do we determine per query what things are good and what things are bad? What's a, what's, how do we get started with that, that sort of effort? So we're going to want to do impression tracking. So when you're, dem when you're uh, showing search results to your users, you don't want to just track what do people click on, what do they purchase, what do they share. You actually want to sh keep track of what did you show them and what was the order that you showed it to them in. And we do this with a, a JavaScript beacon. And I think Google does this with a JavaScript beacon as well. So once your page is rendered, you just fire off uh, an event. And then later on, you have uh, some sort of uh, process that, that collects logs and generates these analytics. We do these things in, uh, in Hadoop using uh, Elastic MapReduce. Um, but so, in addition to returning the results, you, you basically take that, that list of IDs um, and you shoot it back off to the cloud, uh, record what was actually shown. So then you can go in and see, okay, people who search for desk, 
normalize two impressions. What are people like? Because there might be documents in your collection that people really like and respond to well, but you don't show very often. Um, so if you just look at the raw popularity metrics, you might be underestimating uh, the relevance of certain documents. So when we're, when we're working on relevance, one of the things we find useful is Lucene's explain plan. And what we've done is we've actually taken uh, Lucene's explain and we've pulled it all the way through the website. Um, so this is actually, you have to be logged in as an employee for this to work. You can't actually, you can't go and do this. I can do this. Um, but it basically pulls Lucene's uh, explain all the way through. Um, it's a very helpful shortcut because if you're, if you're on the site and you find odd results, it's really nice to be able to just add this to the URL and see the, uh, see the Lucene explain plan right there and see for each document that you show, how is it scored? Um, it's really, really useful. I, I highly recommend building it. Uh, another tool that I recommend building is a side-by-side -side testing tool. So if you're gonna be doing uh, relevance testing, if you're gonna be trying to improve your algorithms, you're gonna wanna be able to look at your results side-by-side. -side. Um, whether they're, they're graphical results or, or not, this is useful. And this is something Google does. Uh, we built a, built a tool for doing this. And we'll actually have uh, internal users use this tool and external users. We'll hire people off usertesting.com um, or find uh, you know, people we know, just people who can evaluate results side by side, give us some data, and then we can use these to influence some decisions about how to, uh, how to do relevance and ranking. So if we have an experimental, um, experimental new algorithm or a different way of, uh, of constructing queries, different data we're incorporating into the index, we can evaluate these things side by side. Um, so once you actually start to incorporate uh, a lot of different data into your, into your relevance and ranking functions, uh, you can have some performance issues. Um, so let's talk about some cheap ways to get better performance. Um, so the easiest one I know, one of the easiest ones I know is to put off sharding as long as you can. Uh, sharding brings with it a lot of complexity, uh, brings performance problems, uh, and not everything works with sharding. Um, so if you're kind of lazy about it and you let your indexes balloon, and you don't keep them pruned down, uh, you're gonna have to shard before you would like to, and now you've got all these new problems. Um, so one of, the, uh, one of the things you can do if your indexes are small, uh, or small, small enough to fit in RAM, so you can just cat them to dev null, uh, which is another nice way to get a performance boost. So you can do this with a cron job, you can do this with a, um, a post commit hook, is just cat them to dev null. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty blunt, um, but it works very nicely. It gets them in the OS's file buffers. We actually do this with a, a post commit hook. Um, but this doesn't work, uh, or it doesn't work well if, uh, if your indexes are larger than the amount of RAM you have. So let's work on that. So one way we've done that is to minimize the amount of data that we have as stored fields um, and just return IDs. So we have a caching layer and we have, uh, we have a, a data layer uh, using memcache. And a lot of people use memcache or have, uh, have similar structures for caching the results of, uh, of their items. So we just return IDs and the application goes and pulls the data in via memcache. And it's a lot easier to scale something like memcache than it is to scale solar indices. Um, and there's, there's, there's kind of fewer problems that come along with it. Um, so along with this, minim you can minimize the number of fields that you request. So the FL parameter that you'll send via HTTP, if you just request the things that you really, really need and then pull the rest from uh, your relational layer, your caching layer, uh, that will really help. So minimize, uh, minimizing stored fields, just make things ind indexable and don't store the, the canonical representation in the index. Other thing is use more RAM. RAM is cheap, take advantage of it, don't be a hero. Uh, it's, uh, it's 10 bucks uh, a gigabyte for the cheap stuff, 20 bucks for server quality RAM. I, th I think it's rare that you'll have something that's important enough that you'll wanna make it searchable that's not worth $10 a gigabyte to put it in RAM and make it fast. Um, so you can do a lot of your performance tuning on Newegg, it's, uh, it's pretty easy. Another, another good trick is uh, SSDs. Um, if you can't fit everything in RAM, SSDs are kind of the, the next best trick. Uh, they're closer to ten, uh, two, 250 a gigabyte, um, but you now have uh, higher than 500 megabytes per second uh, sequential read-write. It'll speed up seek times by 100x. Um, so you can do many more query terms. It'll also speed up uh, field cache loading. So if you've got, if you've got big, uh, big hefty duty, duty fields that you're sorting on that uh, they get loaded in the field cache every time, uh, Every time you do a commit, this will speed that up a lot. And it'll also speed up indexing. So I highly recommend them. 
Um, I also recommend that every developer on your team has a solid state drive that will keep people very happy. Um, so let's say we've, uh, we've kind of exhausted our resources. Let's say we have a performance problem. We have a ranking problem. We have an exploration problem that we've determined we really need custom work. So before we do that, let's think about um, have we exhausted all of our resources and how do we know? Uh, so the, the, the process that I go through is I look on uh, Lucid Imagination search. They have a great search for all the solar ecosystem. Uh, Otis and Semitext have search-lucene.com, another great resource. Um, you can look on the Solar Wiki. You can look on the, the Jira, uh, and Jira on the mailing list. You can go through the code itself. Um, you really want to make sure before you write something custom that you've exhausted all your resources. Because often I've found myself saying, like, oh, I need, really need to be, build this component. It doesn't exist. I've got to build it. And then once I dig into the code, I find that uh, there's more people who are building solar have thought of it first. So if I'm thinking of writing a new QParser plugin, go through the code, look at every QParser plugin. Is it really, do I really need something new? And finally, if you get to the point where you really think you need something new, ask solar user. Ask your, ask your fellow users. It is stump the chump every day on solar user. So come up with a good question. Make sure you explain your motivation, um, what problem you're trying to solve, and don't just explain how you're trying to solve it. Explain what problem you're trying to solve, and that can often give people the background they need. Um, and I often find that just trying to formulate my question, uh, I'll, I'll have a draft of my question, and then I'll realize just in researching it that, I, that I've answered it, and I don't even actually need to, to ask it. But when you do, it's very helpful. So let's say you ask it, there's no answer, there's nothing built in. We're gonna have to do some low-level hacking. We're gonna have to hack on some of the lower-level interfaces. So before we do that, let's, uh, let's, let's build some tools so we, we can do a good job doing this. So we're, gonna, so we're no longer really using solar as a, as, a, as a server with a REST interface and XML configuration. Now we're gonna use it as a programming library. And so if we're gonna do this, if we're gonna use it as a library, we're gonna need a build system. And if we're building code and deploying code, uh, the way we do it is something called continuous deployment. So continuous deployment is, is delivering small frequent changes uh, when they're ready, not doing a, a two-week release cycle, but when changes are ready, you push them out, and you have a lot of tools to support this. So we have something called Deployinator. And Deployinator is a single-button, drama-free uh, release. Technically, it's very, very simple. It's just rsync. It's just builds your files and rsyncs them out to the servers. For search, it needs to do a progressive deploy of stopping and starting servers. You can't shut down all of your, your slave nodes at the same time. You've got to do them one at a time or in a, in a batch. Um, but once you can do this, you deploy more often. Once it's very easy and repeatable and drama-free to deploy, you're going to find yourself doing it a lot. Uh, and the more, the more you can do it and the more enjoyable you can make it, the faster you can iterate. And so we tried to make this really, really easy. On the web tier, we do about 25 deploys a week. I'm sorry, 25 deploys per day. Uh, in search, we probably do five to 10 deploys per week. Uh, so that means if we have a new query parser, if we have a new indexer, um, if, you know, if we have some new uh, uh, search component, we can, with a single button, push it out to production uh, very, very easily. There's no SSHing, there's no drama, everything's very repeatable. And all the tests run. Um, so, one button. So we want to make it as easy as possible. So, so easy a dog could do it. And so we do have dogs do it. Um, so here's uh, Milo, one of the office dogs, deploying uh, the website. Um, and uh, since he successfully deployed it, he put his picture on the site. Um, so very, very easy, very drama-free. Um, and so what we, what we focus on with continuous deployment, if you're deploying 25 times a day, you're kind of acknowledging that things are going to break and things are always going to break. But you're, what you're focusing on is mean time to recovery, not mean time between failure. So if you're doing every two weeks, every month, and spacing your releases out, you're really hoping to avoid failure. But failure is going to happen. So what we focus on is recovery, monitoring. And so once we deploy code, we've got to watch it. And we've got to make sure it worked, and we've got to check the charts and the graphs. And so we have things like this, where we use, uh, we use Ganglia and Graphite to, uh, to track late, things like average latency, 95th percentile latency. And then we break these things down by query type. So if you just look at the overall latency of your entire search application, it's going to be helpful, but you might miss that, oh, all of a sudden, everybody's sorting by, by price. Those queries are all of a sudden way slower after our last deploy. So what we do is we tag each query. So we use a, an extra parameter uh, in the solar HTTP request. And we just add some tags. And then we have a process afterwards um, that tails this log, 
and feeds it into, uh, into ganglia, feeds these graphs into ganglia, and then breaks them down um, based, on, based on how we tag that query. So this was, a, this was a relevance query, and it was a price filter, and then that gets its own graph, and that'll get its own average latency and 95th percentile latency. And another thing we track is garbage collection. Garbage collection is a huge part of solar performance. So we spend a lot of time tuning our parameters, and I can show you those if you wanted to. I think they're probably pretty good, but they'll change with, uh, with Java 7. Um, but the most important thing you can do with GC is to be on top of the metrics so the changes don't sneak up on you. So if you're doing custom code and you make some big changes, you haven't blown out your garbage collection performance. So you can enable uh, all of this debugging information with these parameters. And this is with the, the Sun JVM. There's, uh, there's different, different parameters for using the IVM JVM. But it basically gives you a log file, gc.log, where you log all of this GC information. And then you can write a parser for it that will go through and extract out two of the most important metrics. One of them is the maximum stop time. This is the stop the world full garbage collection. You want to minimize these as much as possible. Um, so you can see these spikes that we have that go up to a couple hundred milliseconds every 10 minutes when we do a commit. So these are, these are okay. These are not terrible numbers. And the other thing you need to worry about um, is the ratio of uh, GC time to application execution time. In this case, you can see it averages around 2.5% and then has spikes uh, when, uh, when index readers get collected. Uh, so in addition to that, you need some alerting. When things go wrong, when you're writing custom code, you're going to break things, you need to have alerts uh, when these things happen. So with solar, what do you alert on? I mean, with, web, with the web applications, um, you know, you can look at exceptions and things like that and 500 errors. But what do we do with, with solar? So one thing to look at is, is the index too old? So if you're doing incremental indexing, you can measure uh, how old are my indices. And if they get beyond a certain length, maybe replication is broken. Maybe your incremental indexer is broken. So you want to know. So you should have Nagios be checking the age of your indices. Disk space, that's another uh, obvious one. And then a less obvious one is the number of open solar index re uh, searchers. So if you, have, uh, if you expect to have two, and you have two, that's fine. If you have 10, that's probably a sign that something has gone wrong, and we'll get into that later. But if you have an alert from it, you'll find out very quickly. Um, and so every time we do a commit, we also want to run tests. So we use uh, Jenkins, also known as Hudson, uh, the same continuous integration system that, uh, that uh, Solar and Lucene use. Uh, it's very, very useful. And so you make sure that uh, you never push on a, on a red build, that you, your tests have passed before you, you do a deployment. Um, and be sure that you test your indexing code, your searching code, and your ranking code. So if you're going to test all of those things, you're going to need some fixtures. So you're going to need some, some documents that approximate what your data set looks like. And a very useful thing to have is, is a little script that if somebody gives you an ID or a document of something that's, that's broken on the site or that you want to test on the site, that you can very quickly save it as a fixture and integrate it into a test uh, so that you can go from something that's broken on the site to a broken test, a broken unit test, uh, in, in a minute. Uh, and that's very useful for, for iterating quickly and fixing bugs quickly. Um, so another thing with custom code is you're going to need a profiler. So we're going to be hacking at a low level. We're going to be caching stuff. We're going to be doing fancy queries. And we're inevitably going to make things slow. And we're inevitably going to introduce memory leaks. Uh, so we use uh, your kit. It's a tremendous profiler. I love it. I look forward to performance problems because it's so much fun to use. Um, if you use your kit, remember to turn off the filters that come with it by default because they'll filter out all the Apache classes. So you won't actually see the interesting stuff. But take a look at your kit. It's great. Um, you're also gonna, probably going to need some sort of primitive library for dealing with uh, Java collections. If you use the, the box types, if you use you know, capital I integer, capital F float, you're going to waste a lot of space, you're going to waste a lot of objects, and you're going to have all this GC overhead from collecting these, uh, these little objects that just wrap primitives. Um, so if you use a, a primitive library that can give you a nice interface around these types of collections, give you, you know, primitive hash maps, primitive lists, um, FastUtil is really nice. That's what we use. Uh, Trove4j is also pretty solid. So we're going to get to a, a use of these a little bit later. So when we're doing low-level stuff, it's very useful to know the hooks that are provided. So solar request handler, search component, QParser plugin, solar event listener, solar cache, value source parser. These are some of the big ones. So I would go through the source code for all of these and just get to know uh, how they work. Go through the wiki, look at some examples. Um, so the, one of the biggest interfaces that you're going to deal with, though, is Solar Index Searcher. Solar Index Searcher has some gotchas. So once you start writing a, a custom search component 
and you interact with a solar index searcher, um, you have to worry about reference counting. So solar will actually manages the count of people that have uh, access to solar index searcher um, by incrementing and decrementing references. So when you check out a solar index searcher and do some work on it, when you're done with it, you've got to decrement your reference to it so that when it's no longer, when that solar index searcher is no longer used, it can be GC'd. If you don't, you're going to get a Nagios alert uh, because you have 100 open solar index searchers um, and your, uh, your, your memory is exploding. Another gotcha is to use a solar index searcher as a cache key in some sort of custom cache. So if you find yourself with a, a weak hash map where a solar index searcher is a key and you've got something very clever where you know, this thing will get, uh, get garbage collected and removed from this weak hash map automatically, you're probably making things more complicated than they need to be. Solar has the solar cache interface where uh, it'll handle the index searcher lifecycle for you. So you can just hook into that and it's much, much easier. It'll, it'll save you a, a big headache. So let's actually write a custom component now. So personalized collections uh, are often a very difficult thing to, to deal with. So this actually came up in Stump the Chump yesterday. Um, if, if people have a very large personalized collection, how do you deal with it? So, so what does that mean? So let's say I want to search my favorites on Etsy. And I want to find uh, desks among my favorites. And so I've searched, and there's this great standing desk that I favorited earlier. So that's not searching all the desks on the site. That's just searching over the, the part of the, the 9.3 million items that I've favorited, just my view of the index. So if I only had a few of these, this is a pretty easy query problem. I can just make a filter query that identifies each of these things, ors them together, and that'll be my, my filter. So this is fine if you have a dozen or a couple hundred even, that'll perform adequately. Uh, but what if you have 90,000 of them? And there are people on Etsy who have 90,000 favorites. Um, this will really break down. You'll end up doing 90,000 disk seeks. The query parser itself will, uh, will choke on the, the giant text string. Uh, it'll, it'll be very, very slow. Uh, so what we really need to do is we need to map, we need a very fast map of primary key to the Lucene document ID um, so that we can take all 80,000, 90,000 favorites and very quickly for each one find the Lucene document ID and turn that into a bit set. And then that will be the filter. Um, so the way we're going to do that is to use some of the interfaces we talked about earlier. Solar cache, solar event listener. So on each new searcher, we're going to basically go through and do a reverse map of primary key to doc ID. So per segment, we're going to have a, a primitive map of primary key to doc ID. And so that as we iterate through that, that list of 90,000, we'll iterate per segment and find the, the doc ID and then eventually generate that bit set. Um, and we're going to store that, that, uh, that map that we, we uh, we do once per, per commit, and we're going to store that in the solar cache so that we don't have to worry about uh, when that cache should be evicted. That'll get, get evicted as part of the normal solar index searcher uh, lifecycle. So we've, you can take a look at this code. Um, actually, Geo on our team uh, wrote this, and you can take a look at it up on GitHub. Um, it's actually built off an earlier solar version, so I don't know if everything will work out of the box, but it's, uh, it's a good example of how to do some of this low-level stuff without things breaking. Another, another example we had was internationalized currency sorting and filtering. So we have a lot of languages on the site, about 20 languages. Uh, and so people will come to the site and each of the different items will be listed in a different language, uh, might be listed with a different currency. Um, and each of, the, each of the users on the site might, might have a different native currency themselves. So how do we enable uh, uh, filtering and sorting on all of these different currencies? Uh, so what we did is we created a custom solar field type, which we, uh, we contributed in Solar 2202. Uh, and I can go through a little bit of how it works. So it enables you to do queries like this. You can do a, a range query. You can do uh, point queries. And these take, uh, take into account the fact that the currencies fluctuate all the time. So you know, the, the ratio between the dollar and the yen or the dollar and the pound changes every hour. And you don't want to have to re-index every hour just because your currency changed by 1% or a tenth of a percent. Um, that would be totally onerous. Um, so what we do is we pass this, this uh, list of currencies around in just an XML file that says what currencies there are, what are the conversion rates, and this gets read in by that custom field type uh, per commit. 
And so we build this map up. And what we do is we actually index the native currency itself. So we index, you know, 80 US dollars. And then if we need to do conversions at runtime, we do them at query time, uh, take these currency conversions into account and apply them at query time. Um, and so if you, if you have these sorts of multi-currency issues, uh, you can check out uh, Solar2202. And here's a kind of a basic idea of how this works. So if you're operating at the field type level, you're going to need to implement things like range queries yourself. Um, so you can see here we're, we're parsing out the, um, the, the lower end and the upper end of this range query, and we're creating a value source, another kind of important abstraction, we're creating a value source that actually does these currency conversions. And you can also, again, you can find the code for this in the, the patch in Solar2202. There's a, one gotcha that's useful, if you, um, useful to know about. If you're using Solar Replication to move files like that XML file around, uh, Solar Replication is really designed to move things like Solar Config and Schema.xml around, and those files require your core to be reloaded uh, anytime they get touched. So if you use Solar Replication to move things like uh, that data file around, it's going to reload your core. And that's probably not you, what you want. So that was actually something that, that, uh, that, got, that got us uh, first time around. So uh, another useful, uh, useful thing to look at is something like auto-suggest. Um, so auto-suggest actually works very similarly to what we saw with location auto-suggest, auto uh, except what we've done is we've looked at what do people actually respond to. So rather than just looking at frequency, we want to see what actually converts. So we've used our our historical data, and we've looked at um, you know, what searches uh, what searches convert best for people who typed A, um, and then we, we we recommend those. Because if you just uh, if you just recommend based on frequency, you might represent uh, recommend some very popular low converting queries. Um, and again, this is actually just built with uh, with a wildcard query. Um, some of the, uh, the ternary search trees and some of the search components don't let you do filters on top of them. And a lot of times, you want to do auto-suggest, but you want to filter it based on the context that the user is at. So in this case, this user is just looking at handmade goods. So we would want to filter out suggestions that were at the top level. Um, um, and again, wildcard queries work, work perfectly well here. Uh, and it's just a, just a function query that, uh, that orders things by. Um, a blend of uh, conversion and popularity. Some of the other things we've built are things like spell corrections. Um, and this is, uh, this is a random sampling of some of the 2,000 misspellings we've seen for jewelry. And uh, some of them are pretty absurd. Um, but uh, we didn't use uh, Solar's built-in uh, spell corrector for this because uh, it, it will often use the the term dictionary as your whitelist, and it will recommend things that are in your term dictionary. And the term dictionary is really not a whitelist. You know, we have all sorts of misspellings and, and bad terms in the term dictionary that we wouldn't want to suggest to people uh, just because they happen to be within the, the least edit distance from what somebody typed in. Um, so what we've done is we've created a kind of a custom whitelist based on WordNet and, and Wikipedia and some of our more, more popular tags on the site. Um, and then that, that becomes the whitelist. And to figure out the order that we should um, rank suggestions, we'll look at um, what queries they co-occurred with. So we look at some of these misspellings for jewelry. Uh, what, did they, what did these terms co-occur with um, in queries? Um, and then look at the, uh, the, the cosine of, of those query vectors with the query vectors uh, for the, the correction itself for jewelry. Um, and that t seems to generate pretty decent results for us. Um, we take a slightly different approach with related searches. So with related searches, we want to look at what do people do in a, in a single session. So if I search for uh, jewelry, and then if I search for brooch, um, that might be an interesting related uh, search. It might show some, some similar intent if I'm doing that back to back within a single session. Uh, the caveat here is that you want to normalize for popularity. Very similar to the way Lucene scoring does TF-IDF to normalize on term frequency and in inverse document frequency. We, we want to look at, um, you know, almost any query is likely to be followed by the, by the query jewelry because that's a very popular term. But uh, so we want to normalize, normalize that query down because it's, uh, it's likely to show up regardless of what the previous query was. So you want to normalize that. So Etsy. 
uh, we are hiring. Uh, please, uh, please talk to me afterwards, and let me know if you have any questions. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm wondering if you're using uh, Solar for any sort of recommendation engine type stuff, because I assume you guys must have some recommendations on your homepage based on purchase history or whatever. Uh, so we're not using Solar for that stuff. Um, we have some, some offline processes that run in, in MapReduce and uh, MATLAB to generate uh, um, kind of similar, similar items and find uh, similar tastes, but, uh, but it's not fed out of, out of solar. So, I mean, you can, you can do things like look at the uh, uh, more like, you can do the more like this query, and that will work pretty well for recommendations. You can, you can basically take a, take a bunch of items that people have liked in the past and generate a more like this query for them, and I've, I've used that uh, before. It, it works reasonably well, um, but we're, we're not doing it uh, at this time. Question for you about uh, the continuous deployment architecture. Sure. Um, how do you guys handle uh, rebuilding solar indexes in that scenario? I assume some changes you make will actually require a rebuild, and you don't want to blast those to production with a broken index. So that's a really good question. Um, so right. So if you have a change that requires a reindex, and a reindex is going to take uh, take you know a non-trivial amount of time. Um, you need to be careful about uh, making sure that if you have code that depends on, say, a newly rebuilt index, that code gets there uh, ahead of the new index. Um, you know, or the, the, that that index is there rather when uh, when that code arrives. So that that is less continuous. Um, so I, I would love to, to have reindexing be so quick that it just kind of happened magically. But uh, but yeah, there's a there's a little bit of uh, uh, machination around reindexing. So you guys manually just intervene in those cases. Say that again. You, you guys just manually intervene in those cases. Uh, we'll manually run a reindex and, okay. and and make sure that that gets uh, that gets replicated. Okay. How are you uh, monitoring your I/O performance, and have you had any issues with virtualization in production? Uh, we monitor I/O performance with uh, with with Ganglia. Um, just has some some kind of built-in machine profile profiles that uh, that look at the basic I/O. Um, but we don't use any virtualization. Um, so we use uh, some, you know, some EC2 facilities for, for, for Hadoop, um, but we don't use any virtualization in the, in the production runtime cluster. Um, I've found it kills Lucene and solar performance by, you know, I, 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 my previous gigs, I would look at uh, Lucene performance, just the basic benchmarks in a, in a virtualized uh, VMware node, and then on a, on a desktop machine, and it would be, Four times slower in VMware, so I'm a, I'm a virtualization non-believer, uh, especially if you're building search applications. Um, I would I would avoid it if you can. Cool. Thank you. Sure. You mentioned on your auto suggests that you take information from click-through or conversion rates and also popularity, and you do a combination of those um, to suggest best uh, options. How often do you get that information back into the suggestion module? Is that near real time? Do you do a nightly um, learning process or analysis? Uh, not as often as we would like. It's, uh, it's, it's not real time. Um, it's, built, uh, it's built offline with, uh, with, with a, a nightly process that runs, uh, um, runs in, in the Hadoop cluster and then sends the data back down uh, from, from EC2, from S3, uh, back to the data center and then that needs to get re-indexed. So it's not exactly real time. It's something we would like to be a lot closer to real time in the future. Um, but uh, yeah, could use some improvement. Anybody else? Okay, thanks, uh, thanks everybody for coming, really appreciate it.